Ever since 9-11, we've been told that Islam is a religion of peace. But in the history of jihad, from Mohammed to ISIS, Islamic scholar Robert Spencer shows that Islamic terrorism is as old as Islam itself. After all, it was Mohammed who said, I have been made victorious through terror. The history of jihad is the first one-volume history of its kind in the English language to tell the whole truth about Islam's bloody history. 1400 years of Islamic war on the rest of the world. Robert Spencer, he's director of the Jihad Watch, is joining us now. His book is The History of Jihad, Jihad from Mohammed to ISIS. Robert, thank you for being here. Thank Good you, to sir. See you. Great to be here. What is the deal on Jihad? What have they done over the years? Pat, it's been a 1,400-year war against non-Muslim countries, yeah. non-Muslim individuals. It's been in, characterized by terrorism, and it has been unremitting and relentless throughout history. There is no place in the world where Muslims have come that they haven't started wars against the non-Muslims. And so I suppose the big lesson of the book is, why do we think we're going to be different in the United States today? Well, why, you know, if, if, when I say this, and they say, well, you're an Islamophobe, <laughs> And there's a protection going on in the West about Islam. They refuse to acknowledge the fact that it's a bloody religion. I remember George Bush said, well, Islam is a religion of peace. And I called him out. I said, look, you're the head politician, but you're not the head uh, theologian. And Islam doesn't mean that. But it means submission, doesn't it? Yes, Islam meets submission, and everywhere in the world, as for 1,400 years, Muslims have made the non-Muslims submit to the rule of Islamic law, or have at least attempted to do so. What, George, this book shows, actually, the, the last chapter is called The West Loses the Will to Live, and it starts with George Bush saying that right after 9-11, and shows in the, all the chapters that go before that how ahistorical and contrary to fact Bush's statement was, and how disastrous it, disastrous it has been for American politics policy that he said that and that it's become the basis for our dealing with the jihad threat. D does the State Department buy that? I mean, they still embrace that theory? Very much so. Obama made it even worse. He, in 2011, as I show in the book, he actually scrubbed all the counter-terror training materials for the FBI and other agencies of any mention of Islam or jihad. Why? He was behold, they demanded it, and he heeded them. Remember that Obama was very close to the Muslim Brotherhood, and when the Muslim Brotherhood was thrown out of power in Egypt in 2013, there were protesters in Egypt saying Obama is supporting terrorism, and he supported Muslim Brotherhood entities at home as well, the Council on American Islamic Relations, the Islamic Society of North America, and others, and they demanded that the counter-terror training materials be scrubbed well, of all mention did, of Islam. Did he have advisors who were Brotherhood members or people like that? There were people in the Brotherhood who were in the admini Obama administration. You remember Muhammad Ali Biari, for example, was uh, linked to the Brotherhood and was in the Department of Homeland Security, and there were others. But when Representative Michelle Bachman called for an investigation, actually Senator John McCain denounced her on the floor of the Senate, called her an Islamophobe, and there was no investigation. Why? Why? The only thing I can think is that uh, people have political calculations that are all wrong, that they think that if we ignore this problem, it will somehow go away, and if we speak about it honestly, that it will anger the Saudis and our other putative allies, who aren't real allies at all, and they also may be paid, some of them. Right. What did Muhammad actually teach? I mean, this is the heart of the root of, of Islam, was the teaching of Muhammad. He is the so-called prophet. What did he tell his followers? He told his followers to invite non-Muslims to accept Islam. If they refused that, then to invite them to accept dimitude, the second-class status under Islamic law, denied basic rights. And if they refused both, then to go to war with them and kill them. And Muslims, as I show in the book, have acted on that throughout history. Well, he had a concept that there was a world of peace and a world of war. The world of Islam was submitted. And the, the Dar al Harb was the world of war, and everything else was, I mean, they're at war with everybody then. Yeah, the, the name the Islamic theologians have given to the non Muslim world is the House of War, Dar al Harb. And the imperative in Islamic theology is that Muslims must wage war against the Dar al Harb and bring it into the Dar al Islam. Well, what about I me? Mean, can you be a good Muslim and not buy into that theory? You can be a good Muslim and not do it 
You might be engaging in jihad of the tongue or jihad of the pen or jihad of the pocketbook, struggling in different ways without waging hot warfare. But there is no mainstream school of Islamic theology or Islamic sect that rejects the idea that Muslims in the aggregate collectively must wage war against and subjugate unbelievers. Well, now, go back in history and give us some examples of what they've done. It's the, de the jihad in India, for example, was devastating, absolutely uh, shockingly bloody. And I detail it. This is one of the first books in English that gives the shocking details of the jihad against India because the uh, Hindus were considered even lower on the scale than Jews and Christians and were thus treated more harshly. And one of the things that's noteworthy in the book is that there was a Muslim leader in the 16th century in India known as Akbar the Great, and he became disenchanted with Islam. And the more disenchanted with Islam he grew, the more tolerant and magnanimous and peaceful he became to the non-Muslims. And then his son, Jahangir, who was an Islamic hardliner, he, because he believed in Islam, was harsh again toward the Hindus and the other non-Muslims. And so people talk about Islam has a history of tolerance. Obama used to say that. Yeah. The reality in history is just the opposite. When the, Mus the rulers were less Muslim, they were more tolerant. What about Spain? They point to that as the great, uh, well, the peaceful era of Spanish and Muslim relation. <laughs> That's another historical myth. Is it? The Jews, and I show in the book from primary sources, the Jews and Christians only had it good in Muslim Spain when they knew their place. They accepted their second class status and the denial of the rights. One time in the year 1066, a Muslim ruler had a friend who was Jewish. He placed him over the city of Granada. Mm -hmm. And the Muslims in Granada, they knew that Islamic law forbids a non-Muslim to have authority over a Muslim. So they rioted and killed 4,000 Jews, including the new governor because they objected to this, and they objected to it on Islamic grounds. How did Spain come free from all that? Was there a war? 700-year war, 700-year Reconquista. 700 to, years? That's right. The Muslims conquered Spain in the year 718, and it was 1492 when Ferdinand and Isabella conquered the last Muslim kingdom in Spain. They had to fight that long? They did. They persevered. They, were, uh, they called them a little, small band of barbarians perched on a rock, the last Christian holdouts in Spain in the year 718. And the Muslims didn't even bother with them. There were so few of them, they thought they would just die off. But they became the uh, linchpin of the resistance and grew and grew and expanded their mm -hmm. domains and finally took 700 years. They won back the whole country. Well, what about the Battle of Tours? What about the... That was in the middle of France, right. In, uh, right in central France in the year 732. Right. Charles Martel, Charles the Hammer, right. he defeated the Islamic jihadis and drove them out of France. And it's interesting to note that many years later, there was a man named Adolf Hitler who said, isn't it a shame that the Muslims lost at Tours in 732? Because if they had won and conquered Europe, then the martial Germanic spirit would have been Islamized and we would have been even more warlike and fierce. Well, that, that was the prelude to Charlemagne, the great king, after Tours. I mean, Charles Martel was... Yes, that's right. Charles Martel was, I believe, Charlemagne's grandfather. Okay. And so it was, uh, if, if he had lost at Tours, there never would have been a Charlemagne, and France would have been Islamic. But so, I mean, but what were the Islamic? The forces were coming from out of... Uh, from Spain. From Spain trying to conquer, uh, well, c Christian Europe, essentially. Oh, absolutely, yes. As a matter of fact, it, the s invasion of Spain started in the year 711 when there was a Christian, who, a Christian count, Count Julian, and he was angry with the Visigothic king of Spain, yeah. who was also a Christian. And because of his personal anger with him, he went to the Muslim rulers in North Africa, said, I'll help you get across the strait, and you can invade Spain. Uh -huh. And so he did, and then the Muslims just kept going, conquered almost all of Spain, except for those barbarians perched on a rock, and then went into France and had gotten halfway across France before they were stopped at Tours. If it hadn't been for Tours, the, the whole of I mean, America would have been a Muslim country then. They were all Sure, been. because there was no other resistance. There was nothing else between them and Poland. Yeah. After Tours, there was no significant army, no significant kingdom. So they could have conquered the whole of Europe. And then, of course, if Europeans settled America, then yes, it would all be Islamic. What is the future of, say, England, for example? They seem to be embracing Islamic law. They're having a, a courts that d deal with Sharia law and things like that. Well, what are we going to do? The only future that England has is to either continue to submit and appease or to resist. 
Either way, it's going to be bloody because there are always going to be some people who are going to say, I don't want to submit to Islamic law. But if the way they're going, they're, that's, they're going to be an Islamic country. How about America? America has a better shot to resist it because we don't have as large a Muslim population. But we have to understand that wherever there are Muslims, some of them are going to be jihadis and some of them are going to be trying to impose Islamic law. We have to come to grips with that, call upon the American Muslim communities to renounce the aspects of Islamic law that are at variance with American law. Well, the, the end game, though, of the Muslim world is to conquer the world. Is that it? That's right. Absolutely. Uh, the Quran says fight until religion is all for Allah. That's a maximalist statement. If you're going to keep fighting until religion is all for Allah, then they have to keep fighting us until we become Muslim and everybody else in the world as well. Yeah, it's funny. They believe in that Mahdi who is going to be the 12th Imam. He's going to come and actually Jesus is going to submit to him and said, I'm, I'm wrong and you are the right one. Is that, is that it? Well, that's Shiite Islam has the 12th Imam. Most Muslims are not Shiites. Oh, they're not. It's about 15% are Shiites. That's the But Iranian. they all do have, Muhammad said that Jesus is going to come back, break the cross, kill the pigs and abolish the jizya. That means that he's going to make war against the true Christians because they can Consider that Jesus is a Muslim prophet who did not die on the cross. So he's going to come back and break the cross, that is destroy Christianity, kill the pigs, force the Christians to obey the food laws that the Muslims have, and abolish the jizya, the tax that the subjugated Christians pay. Yeah. So at that point, it's either be a Muslim or die. And they think Jesus is going to do that. You've got the man in Turkey now, Erdogan, who says that this is between the uh cross and this and this crescent there's going to be a war he said it's already there doesn't he yes he really wants one he wants to be the next caliph yeah the caliph is the leader of all the muslims as the successor of muhammad and he's trying to set himself up to there hasn't been a caliph since 1924. he's trying to set himself <laughs> up to restore the caliphate and reclaim all the lands that the turks once ruled as the caliphate the last caliphate the ottoman empire and so he's put greece and the middle east and north africa essentially on notice that he's going to try to reconquer them that may seem crazy and he may never be able to do it, but he's certainly not an ally of the U.S. For sure. Robert, they say this is the most comprehensive book on jihad that's ever been written. Am I, am I saying it right? Is well, it? I, think, I think so, yes. This is the first book and only book that covers all of jihad, not just against Europe, but against uh, India, as I said, and also oh. shows how the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is all part of the larger global jihad, 9-11, much more. Fabulous. The mission, the history of jihad from Muhammad to ISIS, wherever books are sold. Thank you for being with us. That's extremely interesting. Thank, Thank you. you. God bless you. you too.